Hi right, guys, it's Mark. Today uh, I'd like to uh, run a fairly quick workshop on the principles of uh, operant conditioning. Now, obviously uh, operant conditioning forms part of learning theory and as you should have read in your CHCCSL 005 uh, reading or your learner guide or in your books, there are a couple of forms of learning theory or learning theory comprises of a couple of forms of theories. Now, one is what they call the stimulus and response theory. That's where classical conditioning and operant conditioning fall under. Uh, then you have social learning theory, uh, Albert Bandura stuff, which says you now we learn through modeling and observation. And a third big one is social constructivist theory, whereby uh, it's said that people learn through interaction with their environment, and that's obviously a very big one. I'll get to all those. I'll run workshops uh, as I go along. But I've found over time that uh, many students have problems understanding the principles of operant conditioning, uh, especially when it comes to uh, the words positive and negative, and I'll explain as we get there. Positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, punishment, all that sort of stuff. Once you get it, it's actually relatively easy, you know, part of the stimulus response system, but it, it sort of trips people up quite often. So I thought it'd be handy to do a 10-15 minute workshop uh, to explain how you can see the, the, the difference and distinguish between positive and negative and reinforcement and punishment. So bear with me, I'll be writing on the whiteboard as well. Here we go. Operant conditioning is all based around uh, cause and effect, stimulus and response. Uh, there's a, there's a, an antecedent to something that happens, there's another consequence. And based on that, you either do less of it because it brings you a non-desirable result, or you do more of it. So it stimulates each other. So when you look at it from a, a whiteboard perspective, behaviors and consequences stimulate each other. They have an effect on each other. So they operate on each other. You know, behavior operates on the environment, and that's why it's you know, one of the reasons why it's called operant conditioning. There's an operant in there. Something happens that leads to a certain effect. Now, when you look at this, whether it's to actually teach someone something or whether it's in your own behavior, the first thing you'll have to decide is do you want to see more of, or are we working towards more of a certain behavior, or do we want to see less of a certain behavior? So you've got to decide, based on the behavior and based on its consequences, do we want to see more or do we want to see less? And I'll uh, start writing in red probably because it's, uh, it's a better color to write in. If I can find my red, hang on. When you're looking at you know, doing more of or getting more of something, you automatically start talking about reinforcement. So in more technical terms, the consequence reinforces the behavior. You know, the, what you get actually makes you want to do more of that typical behavior, whether it's to teach someone or whether it's in your own behavior. When it's less, You're really looking at punishment. So based on the consequences of a certain behavior, either yourself or when teaching others, or not necessarily teaching, but trying to influence others' behavior, you've now decided you want to see less of that behavior because of the consequences. So therefore, you apply a form of punishment. So that, that makes pretty good sense overall. And it's, generally, people are quite OK up until here. Now, I'll wipe this out. I'll be going wider a little bit. Here's where it gets tricky, because reinforcement and punishment can be done, can both be done in two ways. One is positive, one is negative, and that goes for both. One is positive and one is negative. That's where most people start to trip themselves up. But keep in mind what you're trying to do with that behavior, with the consequences that are attached to it. What are we trying to achieve here? Are we trying to achieve more of that behavior? Or are we trying to achieve less of the behavior? Are we trying to decrease the likelihood of the behavior happening again? Now, positive reinforcement, so 
we've decided that we want to see more of that behavior or the behavior will be increasing you know, in, in number, that's reinforcement. And in a positive way, that's the classical reward. Reward system. But what actually happens, and I can wipe that out if you will, I'll use another word. Actually what happens is that you add something. You're doing an addition, so nearly mathematical. I'll get there, don't worry, we'll make it we'll make it practical. And this is where you take away. That's why it's called negative. Subtraction, addition, subtraction, positive, negative. Same goes for punishment. You can do punishment in two ways. Positively by adding or negatively by taking away. Or take away, whatever. Where's the difference? In this case, the positive reinforcement, you actually add a desirable stimulus. So something that's desired. So that's the classical one. You know, generally people have no problems with that one. When you do your work well, you might get a bonus. You know, that's the classical reward. So your kid you know, learns to do something, you reward him for it with a biscuit or with a pat on the back or well done, good on you, whatever. It's the traditional one. Everyone knows that one. Now taking away gets a bit difficult you know, because we're still trying to get more of that behavior. We want to see more of it. So that's why it's called the reinforcement. But we're doing that by taking something away. Now how does that work? Well, you take away something undesirable. So, quick example on that one. So you got a headache. Now you don't want that, but you found out that by actually doing something about it, taking a pill, the headache goes. So what are you going to do next time? You're going to take another pill, won't you? So now you are reinforcing that behavior by taking a pill, and that actually leads to you taking more pills whenever you have a headache. Make sense? I hope so. So what happens with that one, you're actually taking away an undesired result. The headache goes because of you taking a pill. So now you're learning that by taking a pill, the headache goes away. The headache, more taking pills, and you get reinforced. The behavior gets reinforced because you're going to do it next time. And there's other examples like that. We'll get to that one. I'll give you a couple of examples later. Now when it comes to punishment, we're actually trying to get less of the behavior happening, whether it's for ourselves or to teach someone a lesson, whatever it is. Same thing, you add something. But what would you add in order to make that a punishment so they don't do that again? Well, you add you add an undesirable result again. Classic one, you know, someone does something stupid, you punish them for it by whatever means, so you add something to it, you add a punishment in the hope that you'll see less of that behavior happening again in the future. That's not a hard one, most people get that. Negative punishment, that's where it gets tricky again. You're taking something away, but what are you taking away that will stop or lessen the likelihood of people behaving that way again? Well, you're taking away something desirable. So what are you taking away? You're taking away a desired result. The classic examples that I come up with here and that usually everyone can understand is a speeding fine, you know, or at least you speed. So there's a behavior and there's a consequence. The cops come chasing you. Now what they try and do is make you do less of that speeding behavior. And they can do that in two ways. 
they can first add a result to that that's undesirable or undesired. And that would be the speeding fine, obviously. So you get a $160 fine. I got, I got the other week because I was speeding somewhere and doing 71 in the 60 zone. Didn't even know it was a 60 zone, but there you go. That will hopefully stop me from speeding in that same area again. Generally works with me. But a lot, a lot of people sometimes adding the result, keep, keeping them, uh, keep giving them fines, at some point just doesn't have the result anymore. And then they have a negative punishment uh, example there, or a, a way of pun uh, punishing people negatively. And that's by taking away their driver's license, for instance, or actually taking away their freedom if it's a really bad one and putting them in jail. Makes sense, doesn't it? Add something, take something away. And that's a desired thing, whether it's your freedom or your driver's license. Same result, well, hopefully, same desired result anyway, less of that behavior, so that the effect between causes and effects, or the, the, the relation between cause and effect is, is established again and remains the same. It's like you're trying to stimulate towards something else. That's where it goes. So, quick summary, run through that one, just to make sure you get it. There's a correlation between behaviors and consequences. Now, we can either try to influence people to do more of, or we can try and influence ourselves to do more of. Now, that would be a reinforcement. Something happens whereby our behavior is reinforced based on the consequence we're getting. When we add something desired, you know, a reward, there's a fair chance we'll do it again. Why not? If you know that if you work hard, you're going to get your diploma, why would you want to work hard? So the fact that you pass assessments, pass units, and ultimately get your diploma handed out to you is enough of a desired result to keep going, ideally. On the other hand, you know, if I know that by doing something, an undesired result gets taken away, that might also stimulate me to keep going, or I might help others stimulate them to keep going. So for instance, if I know that by doing my diploma in counseling, I will not be unemployed anymore. So my unemployment goes, you know, gets taken away because I'll be able to find a job with my counseling diploma, and there's a fair chance that I'll actually increase my study or increase my study action and we'll keep working towards you know, the desired result, which will keep me motivated for units, even if I don't feel like it, because I know that as long as, long as I work hard, the undesired result of not having a job will get taken away. Punishment is when we try and do less of things or we're trying to stimulate people to do less of things or we're trying to decrease the likelihood of a certain behavior happening again. You can do that by adding something undesired, undesirable, something you don't like, yeah, like a speeding fine, but also, well, I'll give you another example. Um, not necessarily speeding fine, well, punishments in general, obviously. Or we can do that by taking away. Yeah, so, to talk in counseling terms, a uh, simple example, the punishment for you not you know, delivering uh, a good assessment to me would be me marking it not successful. Yeah, that's adding an undesired stimulus. So I'm trying to decrease the likelihood of not that great work happening again. I'm trying to decrease your low quality work, hopefully to then get more increase in quality work. On the other hand, you know, if that keeps happening, or if you don't work at all in your counseling diploma, or you just can't find the time or the energy for it, ultimately we would be taking away your enrollment. Now, the enrollment would be canceled. Now that's taken away a desired result, which is still the diploma in the end or you know, uh, the ability to watch videos and read books and all that sort of stuff, that would be taken away. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to decrease the, the inactive behavior. You not working on your diploma. We can do that, do that by punishment. We can also obviously do that by reinforcement, but it just depends on what you're trying to do with that. Now, I hope that makes sense because that's pretty much what I'm, uh, what I'm looking at. This is what I wanted to write down. But I'll give you a couple of examples. I'll grab a piece of paper because I can't remember them all. To give you an idea of what's what, so just bear with me. I'll give you a couple, give you a second or two to think about it, and you tell me what you think it is. So when you're working and you get paid after you completed a task, what do you reckon that would be? Obviously a form of positive reinforcement. You do the work, you get paid. 
studying when you are worrying about a test. So you do more study when you worry about a test. Think about that one. What would that be? It's a tough one. So think about the reason for doing the study. It's a form of negative reinforcement. So what you're trying to do is increase your study behavior, but you do that because you don't like the undesired result of worrying about your results or worrying about your study. So if the reason is to get rid of the worry, and therefore you study, and the worry actually goes when you study, then it's a form of negative reinforcement. Not finishing your diploma after a bout of plagiarism. So suppose we catch you having plagiarized someone else's work and we therefore cancel your enrollment because that's most likely what's going to happen if you ever plagiarize. So what would that be? Be a form of negative punishment. You know, we're taking away your enrollment based on you plagiarizing. You know, in the hope that you do not do that behavior again, or not somewhere else, because at least not with us. But the learning that you're trying to get out of that one is to stop that behavior from happening again. Or if we say, um, burning your hands when you touch a hot stove. That's a simple example in a sense. What happens? Well, something gets added pain gets added because you've touched the hot stove so now what are you going to learn it's a form of positive punishment you get something added to it so hopefully you're not going to do that again so you'll decrease that one I'll give you a slightly slightly uh, more elaborate program so in the Skinner box experiment you know BF Skinner who came up with the, the Skinner box with the cat in the Skinner box experiment a loud noise continually sounded inside the cage until the rat did what Skinner asked him to do. When he did, the noise stopped. So what would that be? Something gets taken away, the noise. What's the rat going to do next time he hears that noise? He's going to do whatever Skinner asked him to do, probably press a lever bar or something. So it's a form of negative reinforcement. You're trying to increase the likelihood of behavior again, or happening again by taking away you know, negative stimulus. And, for instance, an employee is habitually late for work and begins losing the privilege to listening to music while working. What would that be? Something gets taken away, a desired result or a desired stimulus, listening to music while at work. Because you're habitually late, you can't do that anymore. Form of negative punishment. It's negative if something gets taken away. Otherwise, it's positive because you add something. So I think there's plenty more examples, you know, that you can find. Uh, I'll give you another one of positive punishment, for instance. Uh, a student misbehaves in class when he gets a timeout. Positive punishment. Something gets added that's not desired in the hope that that behavior, misbehavior, stops. So keep in mind, and I think once you try and put it in your head like this, Positive and negative have nothing to do with good or bad. You know, the positive and negative in operant conditioning stand for adding something or taking something away. So once you start to get that, it's actually not that hard. You know, and think about, the ultimate thing you want to think about is what are we trying to do? Are we trying to increase behavior or are we trying to decrease behavior? If we're trying to increase it, it's automatically a form of reinforcement. We're in the reinforcement half of the two. And then we can do that by adding something desired, a reward, or we can do that by taking away something undesired, so a relief, if you will. If we're in the punishment side of things where we're trying to decrease the likelihood of behavior happening again, we can do that by adding something, a punishment, you know, but the traditional punishment, or we can do that by taking something away, you know, privilege that gets taken away. Once you start remembering those as mathematical positives and negatives, so forms of taking away and adding, it's actually not that hard and you can work it out quite quick. As long as you keep in mind the reason or the, the, the purpose behind it. What are we trying to do? Are we trying to decrease or increase behavior? And then think from the person who is doing the influencing in a sense. So I hope that helps. Um, questions, you know where to find me. But keep working with that and look up some examples. There's plenty of examples online about positive and negatives and about reinforcement and punishment. 
and just read as many as you can, practice with them. And obviously in counselling, it's a massive tool we use all the time, um, especially when you come up with behaviour plans or behaviour change programs in counselling. The thing you're trying to do is give as much positive reinforcement as possible, rewards for actually changing someone's behaviour. You know, they feel better or they can actually get to do something or they'll get the increase or they'll get the job change or, you know, or negative reinforcement, they'll get rid of the depression or they'll get rid of the anxiety, you know, the anxiety leaves. But on the other hand, you can also work, and I've done that in counselling many a time, where you can work on punishment schedules and say, look, you know, dear client, okay, you're going to do this, this and this you know, over the next two weeks. What are you going to do to punish yourself if for some reason you fall into a bout of laziness and nothing happens? What are you going to punish yourself with? You know, it doesn't have to be corporal or physical punishment, obviously. But I've had plenty of clients that say, oh, look, you know, for every time I do not do this particular thing, I will donate $1 you know, to a charity or $5 to a charity you know, as a form of punishment to myself. Actually, it cuts both ways. The charity is happy, and hopefully, the monetary fine that you give yourself you know, will stop you from being lazy. Or they make it really clear that you know, the depression or the anxiety that they're facing is punishment in itself. You know, so, not doing the behavior will lead to more undesired results and feeling anxious or depressed. So, you can set that up in your counseling contract as well and actually work with that. It's like, you know, what's going to happen? if you don't do these actions, if you can't get yourself motivated to fulfill those actions, like, well, I'll be still suffering depression, or I'll be still suffering anxiety. And that might be enough reasons for people to say, no, I don't want that. So I want that gone, so, because that'll be a punishment in itself. So I'll keep doing what I said you know, I was gonna do, and, and that'll then give me the reward of feeling better. So there's all sorts of ways that in counseling, especially in behavior change programs, you can work with the principles of operant conditioning as long as you understand what you're doing, decreasing or increasing the likelihood of the behaviour happening again, and as long as you come up with you know, a combination of punishment, uh, punishment and reward. There's all sorts of other things as well, as, you know, intervals and ratios and fixed schedules and all that sort of stuff. I'm not going to discuss those. I just wanted to run the basics by you so you get a grip on uh, what's going on in that one. So keep learning, keep working hard. Um, talk to you soon in another workshop. See ya.